okay. We are going to go live now. Okay. I have no notes in front of me. I'm going to work on finding notes. Okay. In theory. That was a very quick... For people like, oh, they're three minutes late. Uh, you have no idea how... <laughs> How much, uh, how much <laughs> Pamela went through to even make it here. So. so, so those of you watching on Twitch know that we just went from daily space, making mistakes, running long to this. Um, so fast, in fact, that I have no notes in front of yeah, me. Yeah, I'll I'm wait. working on pulling the notes. I'll wait. I'm sorry. I'm terrible. So what all do you want to discuss today? Huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah go ahead people people like the background painting she made it i i assume thank you yeah that is one of yeah. my paintings so if you so if people missed it i had a fantastic interview with uh dr klaus and i i can't i don't have his name memorized i apologize but from s from the space telescope science institute talking about james webb's targets so we now that they've wrapped up the first round of of targets, we talked about the different things that but the second time. I just want to state. Oh, is this the second time that that they've asked for scientists <laughs> yes. to send in their? Yes. Oh, he he neglected to mention that. Um, yeah. But at this point, the telescope is is bundled up and and packaged up. It's not getting opened again. Nothing's getting tested. It's going it's going to its um destination in south america for its flight in october 31st yeah second flight of the mars helicopter it went um yes. five meters up and two meters sideways which is impressive um did you know so the loop to loop i think comes next <laughs> <gasps> um hey i'm hoping they're not gonna actually try that no 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 like i like them. that was the that was the xkcd cartoon um so i don't know if 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 sn15 is due to launch you, uh, you so they're go they're they're planning currently, or at least last I looked, they were planning to do the Raptor uh, test today, do the test fire of the engines, yeah, um, with potential launch next week. I appreciate that SpaceX doesn't usually do stuff on weekends, because NASA has ruined so many weekends and holidays for us to yeah. to work with the space agency who understands. While you can get better press on weekends, your staff likes to sleep. I love this. I love this. Um, we were talking about this on the weekly space hangout, and we were talking about how um, sort of you know how difficult it is as science communicators to to stay on top of all of the news, especially when there's a lot of stuff that's breaking. And yeah. And I think you're falling into the noob trap of of space reporting of science communication, which is to try to get there quickly. Oh, no, very rarely. OK, OK, because, you know, like I spent a couple of years like really like, you know, the moment a rocket launched, I was report covering it or the moment a new piece of announcement was made. And it was a race and it just it just grinds you down. No. And I just said, you know what? I don't care. I don't care. Like if if CNN is going to beat me to the punch with announcing the this launch of this mission, no problem. Yeah. So so that side of things I don't have a problem with. It's the side of things where having worked on NASA projects for so many years, I had to promote things live. Yeah. And and I like to sleep on weekends. Yeah. Well, that's exactly it. And so it's just like. You know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And you see yeah. a lot of news agencies that, especially like in the tech space, and they just, they clearly are just wearing themselves out. They go, they yeah. go to some event and they live stream the event and they're all courts coverage. And the price you pay is just the, the exhaustion, exhaustion of the team. And it's, it's relentless. And it's always a race to slice off closer and closer amounts of time. And then right. to also to provide the best coverage you can. And it's just yeah. not sustainable for 
for human beings who aren't ludicrously well paid and well taken care of to be able to to provide that kind of that level of coverage so what what i'm finding i like to do is basically say hey this cool thing happened and we will tell you about it in detail next week yeah so nine hours ago uh crew two took off for the international space asleep. station yeah me too so you know we'll get to it today <laughs> so um, so i have to admit pre-coffee crew two caused me a total amount of confusion because I plopped down in my chair, opened up, I think it was probably NASA space flight. And there's this gorgeous picture where you just see the 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 contrails um, and glowy bits right, from like the, the rocket. Right, the long exposure photograph yeah. of the launch. But you can't see the rocket itself. And it says Endeavor launches or something along those lines. And my brain was like, what? That was a space shuttle. Yeah. I, I totally missed that they reused the name. Yeah. And pre coffee, that was mean. <laughs> yeah, they should keep these names. Like Endeavor, I mean, they should. There needs to be an Enterprise, just, just to state that. But there was an Enterprise. There was a space shuttle Enterprise that was a tester. So they I never... know, but there, there now needs to be a Crew Dragon Enterprise. Okay, okay. But like Endeavor, you didn't need to reuse. But there should be an Eagle. Should there be a, you know, like. Should there be a Snoopy? I, I think Enterprise is the only one that just keeps getting reused. Yeah, okay. Um, cool. Well, uh, <laughs> what do we do? Why are we here? You know, I'm going to say hi to people. Okay. Hello to Beth Johnson, Ian Farqueron, Jason Elric, Larry Beckham, Rich Wilson, Rob Bennett, Subject Line, Trey Harmon, uh, Zach Perry, Zafan Zafan, and then uh, clearly I missed a whole bunch of other names that came earlier. Sam Kemp. Benen, Citizen Gold, Arjone, uh, Zach Perry, I don't know if I already said your name, Rich Wilson, Jason Elric, Trey Harmon, I'm just going to say names wildly now, randomly, Gordon Dewis, Magnus, Borg Kleinkar, Rich Wilson, Eric Knapp, Guido Bibra, Linda Sadiq, Thomas Traniker, Paul Disney, Luke Duke, Ian Farkron, uh, Mrs. Nat, Edwin Devers, I think that's everybody. Um... <laughs> Rich Wilson says I have a whole list of bad Star Trek ship names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess we need to Benny O I, we need to, um, make sure we separate the good names from the bad names. It's, it's true. It's but there true. Doesn't need to be an enterprise. There needs to be an, un, an unbroken line of enterprises from now until we go interstellar. And, and as DPI 209 puts it over on Twitch, it's all about to boldly go. Right. Uh, tell me when you're ready. Uh, I need to open my audio recording software. Uh, which screen is it going to be on? That one. And maybe turn on a space heater. I haven't decided yet. That's it. I'm done with the heat in my house. It, I think I clearly have much more smooth transition from winter to summer than, you know, I have a, a you, you seem to like backtrack back into a really cold spring or suddenly yeah. you're having a really hot spring. We had random snow after it was 70 degrees, like consecutive yeah. days. Yeah. No 70 way. degrees. Nope. No. Yeah. Not here. No. Just, my apple tree was not impressed by what occurred. And again, I'm in my monitor for it. So excuse me while I look in all directions. <laughs> Eric Knapp is saying, just go to the big book of Royal Navy ship names. Yeah, every name that's ever been thought of is in there. Probably. Except for maybe the new ones, like the uh, the Rick and Morty, the, uh, I don't know. Man, watched <laughs> uh, Invincible last night. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, so this was episode seven. Uh -huh. And I think, and it could just be recency bias, but I think it's my favorite comic book thing. Okay. I think so. I think I like it better. Like I like Spider Man into the Spider Verse. I think I like this better. I liked Avengers Endgame. I think I like this better. I think this is the best thing. This is I the really expanse liked... of of comic book stories. I really liked Jessica Jones' first se season. Oh, no. Not so is... much the future seasons, but Jessica Jones' first season spoke to me. No, I think this is 
far better than okay. that. Okay, I yeah. need to watch it. Yeah, the latest episode, the episode seven that aired last night, is just it was a masterpiece of okay. of having competing. Um, like you don't know where you, where you who is the who's the protagonist where do you put your oh. where do you put your hopes and dreams what do you what do you want as the outcome of this story right now and it was uh, yeah. yeah it was it was absolutely terrific yeah if you haven't seen invincible yet and you are into co comic books or especially like a deconstruction of comic books um highly recommended yeah oh if you like satire version uh, boys on Amazon. So, yeah, so I, you know, I watched the boys, and boys is definitely a deconstruction of yeah. of of superheroes. Uh, Invincible is is better. Okay. Yeah, Ben Lowe is disagreeing with me, and and I think uh, get to episode seven, Benio, and I think you will, uh, Ben Lowe, Benio. Yeah, you will. Uh, I think you'll come around because last night's episode was so good. So yeah, <laughs> Invincible. But it which, could just which, be again recency bias. Is which streaming service? It's on Prime. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I think I'm ready to record. Yeah. For all of you meaning to watch that, watch it. It's so good. Okay. Okay. I've watched I the tick. Pressing... It's better than the tick. The tick is wonderful. I stopped pressing. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm now pressing record again. Okay. I've also pressed record. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Rich. Astronomy Cast, episode 603, New Colors of the Radio Spectrum. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing great. Um, Weather is perfect. I cannot complain. Yeah, that's really that's clearly how half of my happiness is how the weather's doing. <laughs> yeah, I I appreciate that deeply. It it can't decide today if it wants to be gray and ooky or sunny. And the moments that it's sunny, it is glorious. Yeah, uh, we you know my fault for choosing to live in a grim coastal rainforest. <laughs> You know, where where the rain starts in, in October and it doesn't give up until the end of March. But uh, but yeah, wow, it's just so beautiful. And all everything is turning green and all the plants are out and all the flowers and the in the meadows and everything's just popping and the bees are out. And it's great. It's great. I love it. Um, all right. So uh, last week we talked about how new telescopes and techniques are allowing astronomers to explore the shortest wavelengths of light this week. We go to the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum and explore the longer radio waves, which are now accessible to astronomers. And we'll get to that in a second. But first, let's have a break. And we're back. All right, Pamela. So last week, as people recall, what was the name for the super high energy gamma radiation? Pevatrons. Pevatrons, which I do not like, but it's not <laughs> up to me. <laughs> um, let's go the, let's go the other, to the other end then, and let's talk about the, uh, the longest, you know, as we mentioned, right, visible light, infrared, ultraviolet, gamma radiation, radio waves, it's all the same thing. It's all just photons of varying wavelengths. So let's go to the other end. Where does the radio spectrum begin? Pretty much where your microwave starts cooking your food. As soon as the wavelengths of light get bigger than a piece of hair, um, it becomes easy to observe them with big dishes. And it starts to become possible to combine the wavelengths of light kind of after the fact with interferometry. And how we do science fundamentally changes at these longer wavelengths. Now, the, like you're saying, like the piece of hair, like the width of a human hair is where the radio spectrum starts? Right, right around there. So, so the way to think about it is if you have an optical telescope, its surface needs to be without flaws. A, a grain of dust on it would be the biggest defect on it, and you'd still be sad-faced about that grain of dust. And this is because wavelengths of light are so tiny that that 
piece of dust is visible and causes issues. Right. As the wavelengths get longer and longer, your mirrors can have bigger and bigger defects. And in fact, you can go from using fancy high polished mirrors to essentially using chicken wire once you start looking at things that have a long enough wavelengths of light. That's crazy. It's that, it's that millimeter wavelength where you start having the, you worry about that piece of hair instead of that piece of dust. And so when people talk about the sub millimeter, that's less than a millimeter, you know, yes. that's moving towards the hair. And then you get into, so are, are microwaves smaller? They're in the sub millimeter, right? The microwaves? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Although apparently you can use your, your um, microwave if it, if, to see like the wavelengths in chocolate and things like that. You can, you can put chocolate in your microwave, you can turn on the microwave, and then you'll see lines of, of heat and parts that are melted in a chocolate bar. So I didn't know about that, but a standard experiment done uh, with university students is basically you put out a call who has a microwave they no longer want. You remove that rotating tray and you line the bottom of the microwave with marshmallows. Mm -hmm. Turn on the microwave and the marshmallows expand along where the the waves are interfering positively inside the the microwave wow. and it's fabulous that's so amazing. yes yeah yeah so so it's kind of crazy we that, like we can't see them with our eyeballs but but we can see them indirectly with our instruments and in this case our instruments are marshmallows which, exactly which i think is exactly. great um okay so so we know that that we're looking at these much longer wavelengths so then how big can they get? This, this is the amazing part. Um, your FM radio gets down to about 10 megahertz, which is about 30 centimeters. Um, we actually start to go past that with some of the upcoming detectors that are going to be starting to look for half a meter, meter wa wave wow. light. And... The physics in our modern universe of what's generating these changes as we go to the longer and longer wavelengths. But what's amazing is because the way the universe is expanding, the most distant parts of the wavelengths, or rather the most distant parts of the universe, their wavelengths are getting shifted redder and redder and redder. So we can only see cool things like the 21 centimeter line in hydrogen by going longer than 21 centimeters if we want to see the distant universe. And and so what do we see at these at these longer like what does looking in the radio spectrum show us that we don't see in in other in other parts of the spectrum? Well, at the most simplistic level, there's a lot of different molecules that have their energy states when they transition between one level to another are cropping up in the radio. So you see water vapor. Water vapor is something that angers many a radio astronomer and an optical in some places too. Um, you start to be able to see uh, much more complicated molecules. Formaldehyde becomes visible once we leave the visible spectrum. And all of this chemistry of what is in giant molecular clouds, that chemistry is all coming from radio astronomy. And what's amazing is because, as we talked about last week, the really long wavelengths don't scatter as easily as the short wavelengths. These long wavelengths can also pass through the disc, the dusty, dusty disc of our Milky Way can penetrate from the core to where we are now. So the universe opens up, becomes more transparent and reveals its chemical makeup just by stepping into the radio. And I mean, the, the classic example, the one that is super productive for astronomers is, is this idea of the 21 centimeter line. Yes. And the 21 centimeter line is one of those things that we see from the coldest, most boring areas of the universe that still have stuff in them. That's the key is there's boring places out there that normally look completely transparent, except they actually have a diffuse gas of hydrogen. 
And these hydrogen atoms have a spin flip transition in them where, where just this change in orientation within the atom releases a bit of energy at that 21 centimeters. This is a fine line transition. And if the molecules are colliding, if the molecules are heated up, or in this case, the atoms are heated up, they don't have a chance to have this rare transition. Leave the gas alone. Right. And you see 21 centimeter light. So we can trace out cool, otherwise invisible material from the hydrogen that's out there, otherwise being transparent. All right. So we're going to talk more about these longer wavelengths in a second. But first, let's have a break. I'm going to need just a moment to look up a wavelength. I'm sorry, everyone. I realized I don't actually know how low they can go with Meerkat and others. Okay. That was going to be my question. You yeah, I, I, question. I read your mind yeah. and I realized, oh, shoot, I don't know exactly how far out these things go. Um, come on, tell me your wavelengths so far. Okay, so you are the one that goes down to 10 and SKA wavelengths. Are you still going down to 10? Welcome to the sausage, everyone. Welcome <laughs> to the sausage. Beth, you're going to have to modify your timing. Um, I'm so, sorry, Beth. Got to be some like kind of sports analogy here. We're going to go into overtime. The time I'm not seeing anything that goes longer than 10 megahertz. That confuses me. I swore SK went longer. I would also like to say my dog smells so bad, it's distracting. <laughs> yeah, it operates to meter and centimeter wavelengths. Okay. So I said it correctly in the story. Okay. I just don't know how many meters because it won't tell me. Okay. All right. I know how to do this. Okay. All right. We're good. And we're back. Um, right. Okay. So, so we talked about the, you know, 21 centimeter line. We think about that's like 0.2 of a meter. And so that's getting into that, those longer and longer wavelengths. So, I mean, the question I really want to know is how low can we go? Well, we are going to find out with the square kilometer array that is currently being planned out to be constructed in Southern Africa and Australia. It is planned to go to meter resolution. And what is really amazing about these super long wavelengths is as you go from optical, where you have these perfect mirrors or lenses, to microwave, where you have these reflective surfaces like satellite dishes that are still very well put together, to Arecibo, which was at the tens of centimeters and basically chicken wire. As you get to these meter wavelengths, you essentially have stabby bits coming out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And this is because what you want is for your antenna to be a multiple of your wavelength. And if you're looking at something that has a one meter wavelength, you are essentially fine using a one meter stick or a multiple of a one meter stick coming out of the ground. Little Christmas trees. It, it's a radio antenna. Yeah. And and so there's going to be a lot of stabby bits in the outback and spread across southern Africa. Yeah, they're, they're a pretty clever design. These these you know I, I call them Christmas trees. You call them stabby <laughs> bits because they they have like all these different little prongs coming off of them yeah. that allows them to essentially point in different directions without having to actually move the antenna. You just figure out which parts of the Christmas tree um, you're going to be using <laughs> to receive these signals from the universe. So what 
I mean, what do these extreme wavelengths start to tell us? And what, you know, what is even theorized? I mean, we talked, I mean, we talked about the 21 centimeter line, which is very valuable because it tells you where the universe is on cooked hydrogen is um, things like formaldehyde alcohol, there's all kinds of really amazing molecules that we can sense as we get longer and longer. Is there some stuff that that we suspect is out there that we just haven't been able to see yet? Well, so this is one of those, how do you say what you can't see? And on one hand, it's going to allow us, as I said, to see things that are red shifted into those longer wavelengths. On the other hand, it's going to start to allow us to put limits on objects that we know about but don't understand. In this case, fast radio bursts is one of my favorite examples, because what it is now turning out is as you shift the wavelengths longer and longer, it takes longer and longer for us to receive the light. And it's not that the light is changing at a different time, is traveling at a different speed. It's that the light is being produced somehow with a delay built in as a function of wavelength. And we don't fully understand fast radio bursts. We are currently blaming neutron stars for them. We don't understand what material around the fast radio burst might be causing this delay in what we see at different wavelengths. We just know this is something we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And any explanation that we come up with for fast radio bursts is going to have to incorporate this delay as a function of wavelength. And that's kind of cool. And also, oh, oh, dear, that's Right. very complicated and and i think the other thing is there are objects like stars things like that that do blast out radio waves but when yes. you put on top of that the um the expansion of the universe and the fact that things are at incredibly long redshift these get harder and harder to see because they're right. pushing what was once visible light is now in the microwave which was once in the microwave or once in the radio is now into the really big radio and so to be able to have these longer wavelengths visible, yes. uh, there's kind of no limit. Um, you know, there's this idea that, that in the far, far future, you know, millions, billions of years from now, future astronomers won't have as much of a sense of the history of the universe because it will have expanded over the cosmic horizon. But the thing that will always be there is going to be the longer and longer wavelengths of radio. And we've taken advantage of this for a long time. The visible um, line that we rely on in moderate distance galaxies is actually the Lyman alpha line, which if we were to look at in a laboratory is blue word of what we can see with our eyes. Mm -hmm. But that too blue to see line gets brought redder and redder and redder so that when we look out at distant objects, we're seeing Lyman Alpha with our visible light telescopes. We'll keep shifting those suckers further and further away, and now you're starting to look at them with Atacama, eventually with, well, bigger and bigger telescopes that remarkably allow us, because it's possible to do interferometry with them, allow us such high resolution images. All right, so we're going to talk about interferometry uh, more in a second. But first, let's have another break. And we're back. Now you opened up this show talking about this idea of using these radio telescopes to collaborate to work together in a yes. way that the shorter wavelengths just can't do. So yes. so explain this technology. Interferometry is the ability of multiple dishes, multiple telescopes to collect light from the exact same sources and that light to then get combined so that it acts like one significantly larger telescope. And the resolution of what we're able to see is directly related to how many times does a wavelength fit from edge to edge. The mirror doesn't have to be complete. The reflector surface doesn't need to be complete. So when we use the very large array in New Mexico, those dishes spread out over miles of land add together to a telescope that has the resolution of a single dish miles across. 
Now, we're going to go from having something spread over the countryside in New Mexico to having something spread over the southern part of the largest continent on the planet. Right. And the outback of Australia. Yeah, two continents. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the two sets of dishes do work differently this is why they were able to split the child across two continents but with all of these little detectors spread out over these great distances they're able to take these long wavelengths which otherwise it's just like shoot how do i big a t- build a telescope big enough to get anything of reasonable wavelength or what reasonable resolution they're able to spread out the the antennae and synthetically get a significantly higher resolution system so we're going to have high-res images of distant objects using really long wavelengths of light and i mean the classic example that i think everybody is quite familiar with now is this idea of the event horizon telescope that took images of the supermassive black hole event horizon at the heart of m87 and in theory has taken a picture of sad j star but we haven't seen the picture yet and Um, so, and with, well, so, sorry, I just wanted to sort of follow it, but like people always ask me like, well, why can't we just use visible light telescopes as well? So th- this idea of like what makes interferometry with radio waves more feasible than interferometry with, with shorter wavelengths? It's, it's that actually the size of the wavelength. For interferometry to work, you need to take all the wavelengths that are coming together towards you and shift them so that even though each of your different detectors is receiving that same wave front at a different time, because they're literally different distances from what they're looking at, you have to shift the light so it appears to arrive at the exact same moment. With the very large telescope in Chile, where they have their four mirrors that work in the infrared doing this, they're literally using fiber optics to combine the light so that the light travel time to the detector is actually the same for all four of the systems. It's basically a physical shift. Right. Now, with radio light, because it can be recorded so differently. We can literally record each individual wavelength, which we can't really do with optical. We can take radio recordings, shift them in software after the fact, and line up those wavelengths. This this is how Event Horizon Telescope worked, is everyone individually recorded what they could see, mailed the hard drives. Right. And then they got put together after the fact. Yeah, when you think about uh, with visible light, you've got things that are, say, 590 whatever nanometers, and you're trying to line up these wavelengths perfectly so that they are all you're getting to the exact right wavelength when 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 each wavelength, as I said, is is so teeny tiny. And yeah. yet when you've got these wavelengths that are a meter across, half a meter across, you just start your clock and go, okay, everybody, yeah, it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the computer can 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 time everything together. And so this yeah. the advantage is the resolution, but not the light collecting power, right? So you exactly. can see an object that's bright. Right. And, and so you, there's two factors that we worry about with, with taking images. The, the first one is how small a thing can you discern? And when Hubble was launched 31 years ago, prior to adaptive optics being a thing used by scientists, it had the highest resolution of anything that we could work with because it was above the Earth's atmosphere. We now have the ability to effectively remove the atmosphere from our images in some cases. And this means that we can get significantly higher resolution images from the surface of our planet. But we run into the problem of the faintness, how dim an object you can see is directly related to the size of your mirror. We, we see this with our own eyeballs to a certain degree. If there's bright light, your pupil locks down. If there's low light, your pupil opens up. 
Animals that work at night, they have huge pupils to allow massive amounts of light to come in. Yeah. The bigger your telescope is, the more light it allows in, the fainter the object you can see. And today, with the very large telescope, we can see things fainter than what Hubble can see with not identical but close to the same resolution because we're correcting for the atmosphere. And um, this combination is amazing. With radio, we just build a ton of tinier dishes, spread them across the world. Right, yeah. And that's why you can have a telescope the size of the Earth. And just yes. imagine what the future might hold when we can have a telescope the size of the solar system. Yes. With one radio telescope on one side of the, of the Earth's orbit, one on the other, record, send the signal home, crunch the numbers on computer, and you've got a telescope that is as big as, this, as, the, as the Earth's orbit or bigger. And ironically, you're going to need a massive radio dish to receive those signals. <laughs> right, yeah as big as the earth. Um, yes. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. That was awesome. My pleasure. Do you have some names for us this week? I do. As always, this episode is brought to you by you. Um, we are supported through our amazing Patreons. And this week, I would like to thank Dean, Stephen Coffey, Frodo Tannenbau, Kensia Pianflienko, David Gates, Alex Rain, Shannon Humber, Neuter Dude, The Air Major, Corrine Demtruck, um, Jean-Francois Rejon Rejate, I'm sorry, Gabriel Galfin, uh, Abraham Cottrell, Aaron Segrev, uh, Daniel Lusley, Jeremy Kerwin, Claudia Mastriani, Justin Proctor, Joe Wilkinson, Jim Garrish, Arthur Latz Hall, Matthew Hortman, J. Alex Alexanderson, uh, Michelle Kellen, John, Aaron Tannenbaum, Roland Warmerdam, Amar Del Riviero, Dustin A. Ralph, uh, Brent Nearnop, and William Lauer. Thank you all so very much. You make what we do possible and allow us to pay for our software, our sites, and most importantly, the people behind the scenes that keep us on the straight and narrow. This would be Beth, Allie, and Rich. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thence they saved. Yes. Dog nope. Dog nope. <laughs> no dog no. Hi, I know. I know. What about what about me? What about the dog? They they would like to go out. Yeah. Did I say the word? I shouldn't have. I made a mistake. She's right below the camera. Uh, it's interesting. So people are talking about these extremely, uh, the wavelength of the Zevs. So Tesla Ranger saying the wavelength of the Zevs and Seafarer submarine communication system is 3,660 kilometers and 3,950 um, kilometers. Is, so is that ultrasonic moon. or is that radio? Mm, good question. Is it radio or is it uh, ultrasonic? Thank you for the bits, savor it over on Twitch. Are you? Thank you. You're an affiliate. You haven't gone. Yeah, no, partner, we're an affiliate. You? Yeah. No, no. Would we were offered partner. Yeah. So we were offered partner when we were part of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, and ASP had legal issues with signing the contract. So we're still yeah. affiliate. Um, I don't think but, I would. <sighs> It's, it would depend on what's negotiable. Yeah. So. Hi. Yeah. I mean, the, I see you. I stinky. mean, the big one is that you, you can't, you can't broadcast. We wouldn't be able to broadcast on YouTube. <laughs> this. So, so they were willing, they were willing to make an exception actually. Oh, well then. So. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Janelle Duncan says, how useful will our current data be in the future when the universe has expanded too much to see? Y history is historical observations are always useful. Yeah, 
put everything in an archive, bury a few archives underneath a few geologically stable worlds, hope for the best. On the moon, yeah. I, I know, you're so desperate, so desperate. Hal McKinney asks, are there gravitational wave standard candle events and does their redshifting correspond to light redshifting of the same event? In theory, yes. So I don't, I don't think standard candle is quite the way to put it. Um, I know that they can get at the distance to these events by how the physics works because you expect a certain energy output from an object of a given size and you expect a certain wavelength. So based on what you see, you can get an estimate of distance to the object. But I don't know if we, we have the error bars where this is a standard candle yet. But when they are knowing about, I'm gonna look this up a bit, but... Um... So like the one they found that was the two neutron stars that were detected in light and particles yeah, and everything else. Yeah, they're multi-messenger astronomy on that. Right. So that was close enough that it's not going to solve the expansion of the universe paradox. So gravitational waves provide a direct measurement of distance. There's, there's no need for a standard candle. But we can't use that direct measurement to um standardize the distance to things yet because with the exception of that one neutron star neutron star that was fairly close no just just in general yeah um so they're, they're calling them standard siren um so uh directly from the theory of general relativity so essentially the the distance to the object pops out of the gravitational wave detection. Yeah. yeah. So that's why they know the um, the distance to all the gravitational wave uh, mergers that have happened so far. They know the precise distance to these things. But in an ideal circumstance, we'd be able to say this galaxy at a redshift of 3.4 is where this gravitational wave originated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we can standardize the distance to that. And oh, look, a supernova went off. Now we know. Yeah. Um, but we haven't been able to match things well enough to do that yet. Right. But what I'm, I guess, what I'm saying is, is that, like, like that would absolutely. Um, I mean. It, you would detect the the distance using gravitational waves. Assuming Einstein is right, mm -hmm. you would measure the the gravitational waves. You would punch in the calculations into Einstein's theories of general relativity. It would tell you the distance to the gravitational wave collision, but you wouldn't be certain which galaxy. You don't it know occurred. what redshift the sucker is at. Is the problem? You don't know which don't... galaxy it occurred in. Yeah. Until you get, a, you know, some kind of corroboration like the kilonova, where you can see it in both visible and yeah. and gravitational waves, and then you're able to do those those corroborations. But yeah. the the I think the advantage of gravitational waves is you get. Is, so I'm just reading a story here. It says, in contrast, gravitational waves can provide a direct measurement of an object's distance. Mm -hmm. You just write down the equations and solve them, and then you're done. Yeah. I've tested general relativity for 100 years and it really works. So there's no distance ladder. There's no need for the distance ladder that astronomers have to use for for Cepheid variables out to, you know, supernova out to right. all that stuff. But as far as I know, it doesn't tell us the expansion rate from which those we know the distance, but we don't know the expansion rate of the universe at that point. Right, right. So we're missing a variable for figuring out the universe. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, you're the one with the PhD in astronomy. I'm not going to argue with you. Um, <laughs> um, Arjone asks, if you were looking for something at the beginning of the universe, could you look at it six months apart for a scope the size of our orbit? Could you look at it six months apart? I don't really. Yeah, I don't no, really... no, because the light travel time is is wrong. So you're not. So like you're trying to hack using the same telescope to observe yeah. it twice, and the wavelength isn't going to be 
It's not like you could watch it on one end and then six yeah. months later watch it. At you're going to see the different. End. You're you're going to see different wave fronts, and it's yeah. not just the motion around the sun. It's also the sun's motion around the galaxy, and yeah. and 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 we actually have to take into account that stuff in some cases. Pulsars force us to take way com complicated stuff into account sometimes. Yeah. Um, Lep Plop is saying, "Are gravitational waves stretched by the expansion of the universe?" They should be. Yes. Um, you can tell which of us had that paper in front of us. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> hold on. I, see, Hal McKinney and Arjona are just battling for the best questions, but I just <laughs> want to give everybody else a chance before I just double down on theirs. Um, Larry Beckham is asking, is anyone mapping series? Um, so it was something that we considered doing at one point, and then it turned out the ast the asteroid was sufficiently small and the science sufficiently interesting that the team just wanted to do it for themselves. Hmm. Uh, Arjun asks, what distance do visible things start to be in the radio? I... I would have to do maths. So I don't remember. So the the cosmic <laughs> microwave background radiation, which is in the microwave wavelength, the beginning of the radio spectrum, yeah, is stuff that was the color of a was red at the yeah. beginning of the universe. So that 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 you've got the the sort of the dullest, dimmest red turning into I, the beginning it, of the, the radio CMB spectrum. was hotter than that. 3000 Kelvin. Okay. I'm, I'm so confused. So it was like, you just think about it like, like what is the coolest that a star can be? And that's the color. What is the coolest that, that ionizing radiation or I, you know, that you can have a cloud mm -hmm. of opaque material and that's, and that's a star. And so that was the color. And then beyond that, maybe it's 3,500 Kelvin. Anyway, around that. Anyway, red giant star is the, the entire universe was red giant star and then, or red dwarf star. And then it cooled down a little bit more and became transparent and light was able to escape. I will have to go look this stuff up later because sure. my brain remembered it being hotter than that. And that is okay. This is why you don't trust your stomach sometimes. <laughs> yeah, don't trust your gut. Um, no, I had, um, uh, y if you do a search, you will find an article on Universe Today written by Brian Koberline, tasked by me getting him to write a story about this very question, which was, what if you could see the cosmic microwave background what would it look like? What color would it look like? Yeah, it's 3,000 degrees. There you go. 3,000 Kelvin. I told you my brain is a store of useless yeah. little data points. Um, I've been super bad on my Anki, actually. I've been, it's, I've got about 100 cards that I have to, I've been about two weeks that I haven't been drilling my, uh, I haven't added a bunch of new cards. So I've been. Yeah, been so 3,000 Kelvin is about. 1,000 nanometers, which is red. So, yeah. There you go. Okay. Now you'll, and now you'll never forget. It's true. You, we'll, we'll all forget. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hal McKinney asks, does dark matter affect redshifting of gravitationally lens distant starlight if gravitational lens in galaxy is moving towards the Earth? So intervening dark matter will do its own lensing of the object. Right. And so will a, but, but it's sort of an interesting idea, right? That, that if you've got a foreground object that is lensing a more distant object and the foreground object is moving away from us mm -hmm. at one speed and the, and the background object is moving away from us at a faster speed because it's farther away, you're going to get two red shifts, right? Uh, no, it, it that that the 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 bending of the path doesn't itself get red shifted. It's just bent. Right at the moment, it, it cranks around yeah. the foreground object. Yep. But you're going to get the color 
that it was redshifted to from the motion of itself from the motion of itself right yes yeah so you so you're only going to get the color of the background object the foreground object doesn't introduce anything to it exactly got it it's that particle wave duality yeah no it's just that it's it's serving as a lens not as a as motion yes and so it's just giving a kick right away and so the movement, whether the galaxy is moving towards us, away from us, doesn't matter. Yes. Very cool. Um, that's it. We don't have any more questions. Okay. I'm running out of excuses not to go give my really stinky dog a bath. I don't know what happened to this dog, but <gasps> wow, we. Yeah. Um, Okay, well then let's uh, then let's let's wrap it up, and you can go and bathe that stinky dog, and the rest of you get seven <laughs> minutes. You get seven minutes of extra time. You get to go it's home true. early. It's true. <laughs> um, but even Halma Kitty foreground moving towards it doesn't matter. Foreground moving back away or towards, although in all cases it will be foreground moving away from us because yeah. there are no. There's only one galaxy. There's only a couple of galaxies that are moving towards us. There's like Andromeda. And they're too close to yeah. gravitationally. Yeah lends yeah. things meaningfully yeah exactly um okay okay all right well thank you everybody for watching us uh today here on astronomy cast uh thanks of course to all of the moderators and uh and beth for organizing the time we really appreciate it pamela what is the next interesting thing that's coming up that people should be watching um, I am going to be working on uh, doing more digital art. And if I can get my act together, I'm going to be streaming, creating digital solar systems this Sunday. Very so that'll cool. be over on Star Strider. Just what, follow me on Twitter and you can find it. When you say digital art, what are you making them in? So what I'm doing is taking acrylic paintings that I did that allowed me to get details. I don't actually know how to create in Photoshop. And I am uh, taking photos of these these physical paintings, bringing them in, and then creating stuff like what's behind me. Ah. So this is a physical painting that I added shadows, I added atmosphere, and I added stars. And this is just one world. Right. I'm going to be creating solar systems. Very cool. Um, I have nothing interesting happening. <laughs> That's not true. I have a couple of cool. I have a couple of cool, cool interviews next week. Jesse Christensen is going to be coming to talk about twenty two hundred test planets, okay. which will be fun. And uh, and there's another interview as well to talk about dark matter being annihilated in Jupiter, being absorbed by Jupiter. I forget, but anyway. Okay. Yeah, Jupiter as a dark matter detector. I, I'm amused that the attempts to use supermassive black holes to put limits on sterile neutrinos, um, not sterile neutrinos, on um, ultralight bosons is basically showing ultralight bosons are not there yeah. in masses that we predicted. Yeah, we just we just covered that. Yeah, dark matter. Yeah, dark matter <laughs> equals ultralight bosons fail. No. Yeah. Wimps fail. Fail. Yeah. Keep on going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I really think supersymmetry is going to get thrown out the window in the next two years. Yeah. I think most people have already abandoned it emotionally at this point. I, I agree with that, but yeah. people are still saying, and the Large Hadron Collider will be looking for super so much. I'm waiting for them to stop saying yeah. that. Stop. The, just, yeah. just just admit it's over. Just put just turn the sign on the Large yes. Hadron Collider to closed. Well, keep looking for day. other things. Just not super symmetry. Yeah. All right. Go wash your dog. Thanks, everybody. Yes. And oh we'll see God. you all next week. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.